Welcome to The Detour. I'm Adam Davis. Do you remember that Sunday afternoon, maybe at the end of June, when we sliced up that watermelon? That perfect watermelon, sweet, but not yet too sweet, and the juice of it was running down the sides of our hands onto our arms, and for some reason we decided we had to eat the whole thing, all of it, and we kept laughing while we were just shoving the melon into our mouths. Do you remember how good that laughter felt? And then how quiet it got once after what felt like hours, the laughter finally emptied itself out. And then there were just those dragonflies, that buzzing, that buzzing, and that quiet. Do you remember that? No? Okay, how about this? Think for a second of where you live right now. Do you remember who lived there before you and who lived there before they did? Do you remember the people who built the hospital just north of downtown? Do you remember the parade on the 4th of July? Maybe not who was in the parade, but the people who were sitting there on the curb watching it go by? Or the people who came by early the next morning cleaning it all up? You don't remember? Neither do I. I don't remember either, but I almost feel like I do. I almost remember that watermelon and those dragonflies. And I almost remember that town, that hospital, that parade, even though I made them up. It's weird, maybe bad weird, maybe good weird. Definitely weird enough that we want to spend this episode of The Detour exploring memory. Paul Susie and Sally Tisdale wrote pieces for the memory issue of Oregon Humanities Magazine, and they read from these essays here. We also talk with Paul and Sally about memory, about civic memory and personal memory, and how much we need it, and how unreliable it is, and what it all means. First, here's Paul Susie, a community activist, educator, and performing artist based in Portland, Oregon. Paul has led a number of Oregon Humanities conversation projects, And he published this essay, Here Lies, for the memory issue of Oregon Humanities Magazine. Paul and I sat down together at the X-Ray FM studios in Portland, Oregon. The historic Lone Fir Cemetery in southeast Portland is a unique urban green space with towering Douglas firs, rolling hills of ornate monuments, and bucolic views of a rapidly gentrifying cityscape. But one corner of the cemetery, known as Block 14, is conspicuous for what isn't there. No grave markers, not even any dilapidated or vandalized plinths. No trees, no meticulously managed topiary. With its low fence and patchy grass, the lot resembles an abandoned field. In fact, it is the final resting place for hundreds of migrant Chinese laborers who are buried in unmarked graves. Among them is a man named Qi Gong. Every Halloween, the Friends of Lone Fir Cemetery produce the Tour of Untimely Departures. Families are invited to walk the cemetery grounds and watch community volunteers perform in costume and makeup as they tell the stories of some of the more notable people buried at Lone Fir. This not only opens up the cemetery to local residents so they can come here and experience these stories, but it also prevents vandals from desecrating the space on one of the most likely nights for such things. There are firefighters in vintage uniforms, well-to-do pioneer matriarchs and patriarchs, saloon brawlers, sex workers, and mental asylum patients. Children in costumes collect candy from folding tables at the cemetery entrance, and paper lanterns light the way between stops. Several years ago, I was asked to join the tour and play Qi Gong, a Chinese migrant laborer who was convicted of murder and hanged on August 9, 1889. As one of the few actors of color in this town, I was not surprised to hear that the tour was having difficulty finding a community volunteer to play Qi Gong. I was, however, surprised that they were telling his story at all. 
I was born and raised in Portland, and I've always been struck by how thoroughly amnesiac our communities are. We have never had any sense of continuity, of connectedness to our collective past. We quickly forget the reasons why things are the way they are, and indeed, we usually remember things differently with each recounting. Why aren't there any grave markers for the Chinese laborers and indigent asylum patients buried at this historic cemetery? For at least 18 years, we've known that these markers are missing. Why haven't we done anything about it? On November 6, 1887, Li Yik was murdered at the Chinese Theater in downtown Portland. Three suspects were immediately arrested, Fong Long Dick, Chung Li, and Qi Gong. Li Yik was a member of a family association, also known at the time as a highbinder society, gang or tong, that was a violent rival of another family association to which Qi Gong and the other defendants belonged. During his trial, Qi Gong acknowledged this, testifying that his former employer, also a member of Li Yik's tong, owed him unpaid wages, and that he was being framed for murder as a result. The evidence that convicted Qi Gong was all supplied by members of Li Yik's Tong, and each witness delivered identical testimony. Contemporary commentators have inferred that the witnesses were perjuring themselves for the sake of scoring a conviction against Qi Gong's Tong. The evidence was flimsy enough that Chung Li was exonerated and Fong Long Dick's sentence was commuted to a few years' imprisonment. But Qi Gong was found guilty by an all-white jury at a second trial and sentenced to death. In spite of a clemency petition, Oregon Governor Sylvester Penoyer refused to intervene and commute the sentence. In an interview with the Morning Oregonian on August 2, 1889, Penoyer said, I cannot see for the life of me why I should interfere. The Chinese must be made to understand that the laws of the land are superior to the laws of the highbinders. Three years earlier in 1886, Penoyer had successfully campaigned for governor with the slogan, Keep the Mongolians Out. When his second term as governor ended, he was elected mayor of Portland in 1896. Qigong vigorously testified in his own defense, drawing condescending praise for his impassioned eloquence. He objected to being handcuffed and hooded per the legal requirements of a judicial hanging, begging that his accusers and killers see his death without sparing anyone the messy evidence of their lies. Unusually for the time, he was hanged in a woodshed adjoining the Multnomah County Jail likely in response to the notoriety of his case. On August 10, 1889, Qi Gong was quoted at length in the morning Oregonian. He said, I no kill man. I die in woodshed with black cap over my face, so I no can see nothing. Qi Gong no kill man. He is innocent. Therefore, he should die in the open air. One week ago, when sheriff come to me and say, Qi Gong, you must die next Friday, I say, all right, hang me in the yard. What for sheriff no do? What for he hang me in the woodshed? I go to hell I die this way. All you friends, I want you all to look me in the face and see what you can see. I no do nothing. I no kill Li Yik. The sheriff issued just 40 tickets to Qigong's hanging, but the morning Oregonian reports that well over a hundred people crowded the jail grounds and stood on buildings overlooking the woodshed. Chinese merchant Said Beck, who had organized the failed clemency petition, paid for Qigong's burial, but there is no marker. Was it lost? Was his grave left unmarked to prevent desecration? Was a marker deemed one step too far for a convicted murderer? We have no way of knowing. In 1896, seven years after Qigong's execution, the Morning Oregonian ran a story about a man who would burn incense and make food offerings at the entrance to the jail yard in the hopes of appeasing Qigong's angry ghost. The article read, 
Haunting a jail yard was anything but congenial pastime for a disembodied Mongolian spirit on the warpath for his enemy's scalp, even that of a hanged Mongolian. And it was to appease its longings and nightly wailing that this heathen Chinese, with more devotion to his dead friend than is found in the hearts of many Caucasians, came to this lonely spot in the jail yard, contributing relief according to his religion, firm in the belief that his act quieted the perturbed spirit for another brief period of time, and always hopeful of seeing the spirit of his dead friend released and on its way to the happy hunting grounds in the Flowery Kingdom. On Halloween in 2017, I played Qigong as the last stop in a ten-stop walking tour of Lone Fur. I accepted the role because I wanted to remember Qigong, and I wanted others to remember him too. I had no interest in affirming the pleasant, self-congratulatory interest in, quote, local history that most people who attended the tour of untimely departures were seeking to perpetuate. I wanted to shake their complacency, wipe the smug expressions off their faces. I wanted to speak on behalf of the hundreds of people in those unmarked graves in Block 14, people who didn't look like today's happy, comfortable, housed residents of inner southeast Portland. And I wanted to show young Filipino and Chinese children that there are adult creatives who might mirror their own aspirations— My grandmother was ethnic Chinese, and though I have no connection to local Chinese communities, I presumed that this gave me some legitimacy. Besides that, I resent the entire calculus around performing ethnicity, which is peculiar to non-white roles and especially onerous for actors of color. Embodying my identities is how I survive. By doing work like this, I've successfully convinced white audiences that I'm not a threat, that I'm not depriving a, quote, more deserving white person of a job. My Shakespearean training was the most sophisticated code switch I could adopt. The training ensured that I would never speak with an oriental accent and that my artistic perspectives would conform to prevailing norms. But all that work, all that training cannot erase the uncomfortable aspects of our history. As Qigong, I performed to around 500 indifferent audience members broken up into small walking groups. I don't remember seeing anyone of the same ethnicity as me, or really anyone of color. I wore a Mandarin collar tunic and baggy slacks. A volunteer makeup artist attempted to give me zombie makeup for the occasion, but we had trouble with the makeup pigments, which weren't really designed for people of color, so I just looked vaguely dirty. My segment was a five-minute monologue that wove in those newspaper quotes with other facts about the unmarked graves. I'd like to think that I spoke from a place of emotional truth, that I succeeded in connecting with audiences that weren't expecting to be shaken by Qigong's story, but I have no real way of knowing this. After about 20 performances, I came away from the night exhausted, unspeakably sad, and determined to do more to honor Qigong's memory. I knew that my version of him could only be a distortion of his truth, which is irretrievably lost to us, in the same way that the exact location of his grave is lost. Chi Gong was murdered by Sheriff Penumbra Kelly and Governor Sylvester Penoyer. He was unjustly convicted of a crime that no one seriously believed he committed. And we can't bring ourselves to place a stone so that we can remember where we buried him or hundreds of others. If those graves remain unmarked, we won't know where the cemetery ends and the city begins. Paul, thanks for reading that. Uh, I imagine that's hard to read. Yeah, yeah, it brings up some feelings. Yeah. You know, it brings up feelings to hear you read it. It brings up feelings on the page. And yet I know none of those rise to what you're feeling reading it, having written it. I imagine remembering your experience of performing. Yeah. Um, I'm a little unsure if we should start with your experience 
or mm-hmm. in a way the the amnesic communities. Yeah, yeah. Can we maybe let's start with those? Like, sure. That's a powerful phrase, amnesia communities. W- yeah. w- what do you mean by it? Yeah. Um, well, lately I've been thinking again a lot about this piece, um, and um, I've been noticing little parallels everywhere in our in our cultures, not just in Portland. Like, like um, there's all of this iconography and intentionality around the tomb of the unknown soldier, and cenotaphs in London, mm. and uh, you know, empty graves, and the end of the Iliad is like the burial of Hector. I've been I've been studying the Iliad recently, and the end of the Iliad is is a, a beautiful, really moving speech that tells you how to bury someone the right way, and that's like the response to all of this trauma and this mm. endless violence that we all seem to be wrestling with all the time, and yet we keep forgetting how to do that. Like we keep needing these instruction manuals, these requiem masses, these beautiful works of art that tell us this is how you let go of of things that you can't let go of. And I feel like Portland specifically has a lot of a lot of stuff that's like right in front of our faces. My car was just broken into. I like someone stole the battery out of my car, mm-hmm. right? And and I could respond with like anger and frustration and oh, Portland sucks and like it's gotten so much worse and and then like just taking a half step back from that instinctive reaction mm-hmm. and it seems like there's these critical insights that are just under the surface all around us that we don't know how to pay attention to. Why do you think it's so hard to uh, to do this better, to yeah. remember better? Yeah. Well, in some ways, I think it's intentional. I think that we built this city on rock and on roll. Rock and roll. <laughs> we we built this city in ways that, like, we don't want to repeat ourselves. We don't want to make it easy for ourselves to remember these things. Uh, there's power sharing structures and mm-hmm. checks and balances and city council and neighborhoods that don't talk to each other. Like the city wanted from the beginning to insulate itself from its own memories, stolen land. Mm-hmm. We wanted to in- insulate ourselves from these things. And then this is the consequence of, in- of all that insulation. Mm-hmm. We, we are constantly forgetting how connected we really are to each other and the shared histories that we all have with each other. That feels a little bit hopeful, weirdly, at the end of it, when you said we're forgetting how connected mm-hmm. we are. To, it feels like, huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm optimistic, I think, because it's a sunny day <laughs> and because um, because I'm rehearsing in Iliad, so mm-hmm. I, I get to work out all my rage issues on stage. But I'm optimistic because... Um, to quote Jurassic Park, like nature finds a way, uh-huh. like our communities endure somehow. Hmm. These this continuity, like I'm shocked that even the Oregonian archives are accessible enough to the point where I could have researched this as much as I did. Yeah, you know, even that it's interesting when you read what we describe as Qigong's words, mm-hmm. which of course are some version of whatever mm-hmm. he might have said, mm-hmm. somehow, even with all of that, they still hold tremendous power. Yes. So you said, yes, you feel that too. How, Absolutely. What's going on there? What's your sense of what's going on there? Yeah, yeah. That to me is like the miracle of connection, of human connections, right? Like in spite of all of the racist lenses of translation and transliteration that have interposed themselves between our present moment right now in 2023 and when Qigong was hanged in 1889, there is still something about Qigong, about this person who defended himself in court, who testified from the stand, who moved people to tears Mm. in his trials and inspired people all over the West Coast. Academics and newspaper editors from San Francisco and Astoria were writing into the Oregonian saying, this guy clearly didn't do anything. And they weren't even at his trial. They were just reading the newspaper accounts at that time. 
And so they all flooded the governor's desk with petitions. Something about what he said and how he said it is perpetuating itself, has given him a kind of immortality. And that gives me faith for civilization generally, right? Uh Like all the awful stuff that, that is happening now and has been happening for thousands of years, there is still some kind of through line of of hope and, and of community and love and care for others that has somehow survived across different filters. So again, it's a beautiful day outside <laughs> and I'm hydrated right now. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting, hydrated right now. And it, and it makes me think of uh, your performing yeah. as Qigong and that, yeah. that does that didn't sound like a particularly hopeful experience. Right, right. It sounded like a really uh, difficult and in some ways really demoralizing experience. Yes, yes. Yes, it was... So this was Halloween of 2017. It was before the pandemic. Uh, the Friends of the Lone Fur Cemetery are a really sweet bunch of people who just really care about that cemetery and and have organized themselves to like lead walking tours and clean up the cemetery from time to time and and uh, one of them reached out to me saying that there was this character that they had been trying to get performers to play for a while and I think there had been an a, an actor a few years before me who had played Qigong and, uh, and then they stopped and I wasn't able to find out why or what happened mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and I had never heard of Qigong and so I did some of the research and I and I looked at the materials that they had and and yeah my stop was like right by this quartet of beautiful beautiful sequoia trees mm. almost in the center of the cemetery and it's a stone's throw away from block 14 and there's these beautiful views all around it and and yeah little groups of about 20 to 30 people would come to me every 5 minutes and I would be like Oh, I didn't see you there. Let me tell you the story. Of, you know, it was kind of cheesy, but it was also mostly those words that I just read. Yeah. And and then some facts about who else was like the hundreds of others who whose stories we don't know. And and I had like just about 5 to 10 minutes with each with each group. Yeah. And I was crying every time. Uh-huh. Like I, I <laughs> so indulgent. I I moved myself to tears every time. Yeah. Um because I just got angrier and angrier that the absurdity of mm-hmm. that situation yeah, where, you know, these firefighters in their vintage uniforms and these, you know, Victorian matriarchs in their hoop dresses and, and people were like, it, it, it felt a little bit like Disneyland. Yeah. And then Qigong was this reality check that, you know, actually... There's a whole other sub layer to this that we are living right now, and we are a part of that story right now too. Right. It feels like the metaphorical yeah. power of that experience is so uh, close to the surface that it's almost not a metaphor. Right. Right. It's right. like you want public history here. Right. Here's what I need to do right. and experience in order to provide even five minutes for you as you walk right through the lovely park. Right, right. But you came out of it. You say more committed to telling Qigong's story. Yeah, there, there's something, there's something about the empty tomb or the unknown tomb. There's something about how that landscape of inner Southeast Portland with its own history, with its ongoing history of racialized violence, right? Like, I I never pronounce his name right. I apologize. Mulugeta Sarah. Yeah. yeah, Was that he, that's the same neighborhood, right? And and until the twenties, I remember one of the facts I, I used to say in the, in the walking tour was that until the 1926, um, Chinese people, Asian people weren't allowed to be in Southeast Portland at all. Yeah. Like that wasn't repealed until 1926. And so, you know, there's, there's a whole, there's something about that sort of critical mass of history and of story 
that that has its own momentum for me. I can't uh, I can't not think about mm-hmm. all of these things as I'm walking through. The, mm-hmm. I live there. I live on 34th and Belmont. Yeah. Um, I can't not think about all of these things as I as I live in my in my own city. It seems like many of us can. Yeah. Not think about. I mean, this is yeah. to go back to the amnesia communities. Yes. What is it that drives the effort to get people who are not predisposed or ready to think about it, Mm -hmm. to think about it? Mm -hmm. Knowing that I would rather know than not know. Mm -hmm. That that knowing is the beginning of wisdom. And so I, I would hope, I would hope that my friends and my neighbors would tell me if I was being incredibly disrespectful in my ignorance of not knowing mm-hmm. the particular custom or the particular, you know, what whatever it is that I'm that I'm unintentionally desecrating, mm-hmm. and I I want to assume the benefit of a doubt of the doubt for everybody around me that like whoever reads this and didn't know ahead of time, this is not meant to make people feel bad. This is meant to inform. Right, and that we can, we can make better choices, and hopefully we can, we can figure out a way to appropriately and respectfully commemorate um, what we've what we've all lived through and benefited from as a result of all of these things. So that the commemoration, to use the word you just used, yeah. which seems like it has memory in it, yes. and and co. Yes. Sort of remember together, but I felt like you were really pointed forward as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I don't think that you know, as we as we build up and we you know we work on affordable housing and we we try to revive the city from from whatever traumas that we've been experiencing in the last few years. Um, rebuilding our city and 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 rebuilding our communities has to take into account an understanding of 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 what we've been building on to begin with mm-hmm. right i mean i mean that literally when i say yeah. if we don't know where the graves are we don't know where the cemetery ends and there's long been rumors and you know um urban myths around like uh central catholics high school mm-hmm. is 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 built on reclaimed property from the cemetery and supposedly they moved everything underneath the schools i mean it sounds it's kind of campy it sounds like the setup of a horror movie um the the neighborhoods all around lone first cemetery were once rural and farmland and now it's all neighborhoods and businesses and schools and yeah. And so it's kind of, yeah, it's like, it's not even a metaphor anymore. It's literally building on graves. Can I ask you to read the last sentence again? Yeah. Of the essay? Because I think <laughs> yeah. it feels, bo- again, both literal and metaphorical. If those graves remain unmarked, we won't know where the cemetery ends and the city begins. How does that sentence sit for you when you just read it on its own there? Well, the the dark side of this optimism is that, like, I don't think we ever can really know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no way that you, you could, <laughs> I can't imagine that the political situation in the city would ever get itself together enough to accept the implications of all of this and, like, you know, do right by these unmarked graves. Um, I mean, I haven't been able to do it for the last 18, 19 years now. What makes me think that mm-hmm. they could get it together in the next 20 years? Um, and, and, then, and then so the reckoning is how do, you, how do you come to peace with the idea that like all of this, all of this is stolen land. Mm-hmm. All of this is fruit from a poison tree. And some of it we have agency in, and some of it we don't have agency in, and that all of that is a matter of nuance and shadings and and discretion, and um, yeah, yeah, that's humbling. Yeah, 
it's interesting to think again about the like do right by these mm-hmm. by the people who died in mm-hmm. in terrible and forgotten deliberately overlooked circumstances mm-hmm. what would it mean to do right by them and then mm-hmm. what would it mean in thinking about that to do right by us yes broadly yes 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 and and there maybe maybe there's the there's the thread is that like we can never n- not without like some kind of divine omniscience we can never be able to say okay now we've done right by them we built a fancy monument everything's fine now right we've we've committed to reparations everything's fine now no it's it's always going to be this ongoing uh process for every generation to confront how can i be okay with what i've inherited and uh for me personally without trying to in any way um influence others i think the solution is to try like i don't get to know Mm -hmm. that i've succeeded if i ever succeed all i get all i get to know is that i'm trying and that I'm always trying and that that's expensive and that's hard and that's humbling and it's hard work and, and I can't be complacent with that. Um, but trying to bury Hector the right way, mm-hmm. trying to, whether it is a stone or it's writing more pieces or something, uh, for Qigong or, um, yeah, I think the trying is, is, the important part and and it's so subjective but it's also intuitively knowable a kid can know mm-hmm. when you're trying and when you're not trying mm-hmm. like anyone can can see the difference and it's so hard to like put it into words but when you're when a leader or a community is making an honest effort to reckon with something you feel it and you understand it. Mm-hmm. And I have faith in that. Mm-hmm. It's really powerful. And it's also, it feels so challenging to think about trying to bury too late mm-hmm. the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Which is a way of thinking about how are we going to be buried. Yes. 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 Because because in doing this, we are actually prepping our own monuments. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, a pharaoh would be like, I got to build another pyramid now. Um, what is our answer to that? You know, what is our answer to knowing that uh, we, we just have what, however much time we have? Yeah. <laughs> on our next episode yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, lo- I love it I love that the hearty laugh that follows what feels like uh, some serious stuff um, I guess mm-hmm. I want to ask like as you walk around southeast Portland you think mm-hmm. about what is and isn't uh, memorialized publicly right um, you got questions in your head a question in your head or a strong feeling in your heart I mean uh, I was I was talking uh, at the beginning about all the stuff that's right in front of mm-hmm. our faces and for me the strong feelings the strong the stronger emotions come up the more reactive emotions come up with our housing crisis mm-hmm. with folks living outside right now and people being swept from Laurelhurst Park and people being swept from businesses and from you know, parking medians uh, all over Southeast Portland, and um, and and losing everything repeatedly, and suffering visibly, right next to our comfortable houses mm-hmm. and our vehicles and our the places where we walk our dogs and play with families and stuff and schools and um and so. Uh, hmm. Yeah, there's no, there is no tidy, hmm. like, oh, if we could only all just do this, then everything would be fine. No, this is the result of years of structural 
racism and neglect and the impoverishment of our social safety nets and and our, our almost intentional starvation of communities mm. of communal structures and ties um yeah and and that's you know of course it's not going to be as simple as just building more housing or just <laughs> yeah just giving everybody money like there's there's no one size fits all solution to any of this but it is interesting more than interesting it's worrying in all sorts of ways to think like we're looking back 140 years yeah. as we've been talking about about Qigong and to yeah. think like 140 years from now, what would it take? What would a community have to do to look back and see and recognize and maybe even honor? Uh, yeah. 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 The, um, the figure in the article um, who, uh, Qigong's friend who comes back to the jail seven years later the the rest of that article in the Morning Oregonian described him as probably a vagrant, as someone who's sleeping on the streets. And uh, the reporter picked up the story because he was new on the beat, and he was getting to know the jailer at at the at the jail. And the jailer was new, hmm. and the jailer told him this anecdote. And then the jailer said that, and I'm paraphrasing, but the jailer said that he let this guy come back every day for like six weeks. And then one day he noticed that the guy brought his bedroll and was preparing to sleep under the stairs at the jail. And that's when the jailer said, all right, that's it. No more. Never come here again. And kicked him. Hmm. The, the article describes it in the original article in the Oregonian. Um, so that's another parallel, right? Like, he was trying to bury Qigong the right way. Mm. He was going through whatever he was going through, this guy. And our city is still exactly in that same spot where we're, everyone is just trying to do right. They're trying to figure their stuff out and trying to survive. And we keep running afoul of ourselves and each other. And, uh, and we kept get, keep getting swept. Every time we sweep, we are sweeping away that much accumulated memory mm -hmm. and effort at reconciling. I mean, that's a little simplistic, but but that's that's what I'm seeing every time you know someone loses their birth certificate and mm -hmm. their their ID, and then now they and whatever other challenges they were already dealing with, now they have this extra layer mm. of erasure to contend with every time their tent is swept, every time their belongings are trashed. Mm -hmm. And who are we to say, you know, that anyway, <laughs> I could go on and on. But that impulse in Qigong's friend yeah. to go back, uh, yeah, mark the place, mark the person, mark what led to the the terrible way that his life ended. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should leave it there. Maybe we should leave it. Mm -hmm. Can I also, though, say just a big thanks for the uh, the work and the how much of yourself you're putting into this? Thank you. Thank you. Paul Susie is a community activist, educator, and performing artist based in Portland, Oregon. Sally Tisdale is the author of several books, including Advice for Future Corpses, Stepping Westward, and the essay collection, Violation. I sat down with Sally at the X-Ray FM studios to talk about her essay, The Ethics of Memory and Writing, and interestingly, how Zen Buddhism can help us question conventional truths about others and ourselves. First, here's Sally reading an excerpt from her essay, A Winner Every Time. When I was six, I entered a talent contest at the county fair and danced the twist on stage in front of a noisy crowd. At the next year's fair, I shook hands with the television pilot Sky King and his niece, Penny. A few years later, I beat a grown man in the pie-eating contest and got a red transistor radio. 
The fair was the pinnacle of my summer, of every summer in a big county full of ranchers, loggers, and a lot of lonely land. At the fair, children ran feral. I wandered the long, cool exhibit halls filled with pickles, quilts, and giant squash. We went to the rodeo and the demolition derby, a concert of joyous noise and violence. In the commercial building, I collected buttons advertising vinyl siding, Bible stories, and tractors. In the fragrant livestock pens, I leaned on the metal gates to gaze at pigs, chickens, and lambs destined for auction and slaughter. Sharp sun soaked the acres of unkempt grass, and my brother and I would curl up in a spot of weak shade for lunch. Hot dogs, baked potatoes wrapped in foil, cotton candy spun out of thin air, and ice cream dribbling onto our bare legs. But first, last, we came for the midway, the screams and shouts, the Doppler roar of the roller coaster, the throng of humid teenagers necking in corners. Conic speakers perched like shofar at the intersecting paths, blaring static-ridden pop songs. We came for the hammer, the scrambler, and the zipper, for the faint nausea of centrifugal force. We came to toss ping-pong balls into fish bowls and throw darts at balloons, dreaming of a giant stuffed panda bear. August's twilight was a gentle dimming of the day's glare that seemed to last for hours until the shadows rose and turned the sky black. Then the lights snapped on, flashing gold and scarlet, green and orange, and my chest swelled with something tender and unnameable. I didn't know the words for a long time, but I came for the melancholy. I came for the longing. How vivid these scenes are. How treacherous. Memory is the encoding of experience, a mysterious collection of chemicals and cues. The act of remembering is called retrieval, and it could hardly be a less accurate term. We think our lives are recorded somehow, captured and preserved, but every retrieval of a memory is the act of recreation of it, a process known as reconstruction. Each memory of anything, of everything, is built from scraps and shards and is never complete. John Updike said that when he tried to remember his past, all he found was a background of dark matter. We can't see this mass, but it moves us. He wrote, all that is not said remains buzzing. We take the traces of encoding and then fill in the gaps with fragments inferences, traces of other events, new lessons. Everything we experience can impact how we remember, what we remember. With each pass, each recollection, tiny deformations appear. No memory is ever accurate exactly, never a neutral snapshot of what happened. It lives once and is gone, and with each retrieval, the reconstructed memory is more deeply laid, more subtly framed, more nuanced. The older our memories, the more they have changed. Who can I trust? Our siblings reconstruct memories from similar fragments, but differing inferences and hopes. Inferences and hopes that diverge from ours more with every passing year. Our supposedly shared memories are often near, but never exact. My brother and sister and I have never experienced the same event, even when we were standing shoulder to shoulder. Each time a person is told that their memory of an event is correct, the memory becomes more vivid. That's right, my brother says to me when I ask him about the demolition derby, the ice cream, and the scene sharpens. The colors grow brighter. That's right, I say to myself each time I remember. The faint scent of manure and the perfume of popcorn wafts by. My toes curl in the dusty grass. Sally, thanks for reading that. Thank you. And you say in a couple of places, you talk about memory as betrayal, memory as treachery. I thought maybe we could start with those two small <laughs> words, betrayal and treachery. Yes. Uh 
I have been studying the science of memory for almost a year now, and it has undermined a lot of what I thought about how we remember our past. And as a writer, I often I often mine the past for material, uh, my own past and the pasts of others. And it's pretty hard to be a writer without doing that. Mm. So when you begin to realize that a great deal of what you remember is, in fact, not true or certainly not verifiable and different from what other people remember, then that's what I mean by by betrayal is, in a sense, I felt in this last year like I've lost my past Mm. uh, and certainly lost the ability to say, this is what happened. So in this essay, I'm really trying to make the point that there is a kind of internal story that may differ from the external story. And the problem is when we insist that they are the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, because I write about the past, I also read other writers about their pasts. And I am now very suspicious, yeah. very skeptical <laughs> of especially detailed memories. Which I feel like so many of your personal essays start with incredibly vivid memories, whether it's crickets or uh, your warm face against a cool glass cover to meet at a butcher's. Uh, so many of the essays start with vivid memories. And so it's, that's, in a way, the reason I wanted to start by asking you about betrayal is because inaccurate or incomplete is one thing. Betrayal feels like, all right. Right. Well, I'd like to think that the 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 detail yeah. that I start with may actually be completely true because, like, the cold, putting my warm face against the cool glass case in the butcher shop. Yeah. The butcher was my father's best friend. My mother bought meat probably every other day. We were there a lot. I spent mm. many, many, many days of my childhood in that place. And I did that probably a, a thousand times. Mm-hmm. The betrayal is that I in my mind, I then want to make a particular day and a particular story out of that detail. For instance, we were when we were very young, we were allowed to wander pretty freely. I had a very feral childhood. Mm-hmm. So even by the age of seven, I was being sent to the grocery store with money to buy a loaf of bread or a quart of milk and take it home. And I remember vividly, as you say, buying ketchup. And as I was crossing the intersection home, I dropped it, and it shattered Mm. in the middle of the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. And I completely panicked and burst into tears and ran home, leaving this smashed ketchup bottle in the middle of the street. I think that happened exactly like that, but I have no idea what surrounded it. The mistake we make as writers, I think, is to then create a story from that. And I see writers do it all the time. Have you read a memoir that has a carefully reconstructed conversation from when the writer was six? We do not remember conversations from when we are six. So it's interesting. You're, in a way, it feels to me like you're describing an ethic around nonfiction yeah, writing. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder, I kind of want to ask you to move away from writing for a minute, okay. if I can. And I'm thinking, because all of us, whether we write or not, we've all, I think, built up a sense of our life based on these memories that, as you have been saying, like the memories actually become clearer as we reconstruct them. Uh, Is that a bad thing that we're hanging our understanding of ourselves on memories which can't be as clear as we have made them become? So I'll do a 180 for you. Great. Because I've also been a practicing Zen Buddhist for a long, long time, since my early 20s, 40 years. And I have a completely different ethic from that point of view, which is that we are reborn continually. We Mm. are never a self for long, that the self I was yesterday has changed just a little bit to be the self today, Mm. and a great deal since that little girl who dropped the ketchup bottle. She is not me. Mm. Neither is the teenager who went to the fair. Neither is the young woman. They are not me. They are my ancestors, and I have inherited their 
tendencies and a kind of genetics from them. I'm sort of stuck with the package they gave me, Mm -hmm. right? I inherit the consequences of their choices. I inherit their points of view. I inherit physical injuries and all kinds of other things from my ancestors. Well, when you were talking about your writing, you really, it sounded like, had the reader in mind when you said we shouldn't present our memories as being more true than we can know them to be. But still, we're trying to put some story together for the reader. As you've been talking about Buddhism, it sounds like you're saying the story we tell ourselves, we, sh- we shouldn't trust that either. Well, not trust it so much as not be driven by it, okay. if that makes sense. Uh, we all carry scripts in our head. We all carry hmm. um voices in our head from the past that tell us we are certain kinds of people or that we like or don't like certain things and so on. I mean, some people have a script about being unlovable. Mm. Some people have a script about being smarter than everybody. Everybody's got a script. The problem is when we believe them all and don't recognize them as something from the past. It's interesting. It's just it's interesting to think about uh, the relationship with the, between the things we don't know in the past, which it sounds like I feel like you're making an argument that we know less than we, we act as if we do. Yeah, we know much less, and and as you read the science, which is like I said at the beginning, undermines a lot of what we presume about ourselves. The more you remember it, the more it changes. The more you verify it, the sharper it gets, and. All these, you know, it's actually very easy to create false memories in people, and they are just as emotional, even more detailed and more vivid than accurate memories, often. And people often, they'll say, well, it's so clear, it's so vivid, it must be true. And in fact, that's kind of the opposite. We we sort of polish a lot of our memories. Mm -hmm. And because of the way memory works neurologically, It's continually grabbing new fragments every time you reconstruct it. I guess I'm still wondering about the relationship. Like for many of us, that doesn't seem like an unproductive thing. No, no. How do we remember that we're not that person that we remember Hmm. being? That every day is an act of reminding ourselves, and I love the word remind, Mm -hmm. reminding ourselves that we are not who we were, that we are reborn into this new conditioned self. One of the interesting conflicts we, we come to here is I tell my younger students that it's too soon for them to write many of the stories they want to write. They don't have any kind of space or objectivity or even, um, understanding of the story that they're trying to write. They haven't found that internal story completely yet. And they, so they want to write about things that are still very fresh. And I often tell students, give it time, you know, let it calm down, find some composure around the event, whatever it is. But in fact, memory science tells us that you should write it right away, immediately, because it's going to change. And so I started writing memoir when I was in my early 20s. And I read them now and I can think, yeah, that's not a bad piece of writing, but I didn't really understand what I was writing about. That word you just use, understand, feels like, okay, there's accurate memory of events, and then there's self-understanding. Right. What did that event mean? And what will that event continue to mean? Because our understanding will change too. What what seemed to mean something in my 20s has has shifted. So then it feels to me like you're making a case for uh, understanding as distinct from and I think more important than something like remembering. Right. And I, I'm okay with all of that as long as we're acknowledging that that's what we're doing. Um, And here's another side to that, which is, again, back to the Buddhist point of view, which is that you can change the past. And 
we we say the present flows to the past, the past flows to the future, and so on. It's not just that time is not exactly this linear river that we're swimming through. It's much more complex than that, even in physical terms. But that as we understand our past and the other characters in our story, what happened takes on new meanings. So, for instance, I, you know, my father appears in a lot of my stories because he was a very difficult person. He was an active alcoholic. He had a huge temper. He sometimes hit us. He, he was also very bright. He was very competent. He was, it, it was, I had a very confused relationship with my father. Uh, and for a long time, I blamed him for a lot of my stuff, a lot of my troubles. That I had a difficult father, I had a difficult upbringing, blah, blah, blah. The time came when that got a little tiresome. Hmm. And I l- began to understand, you know, you hit your 30s and you hit your 40s and you see your parents in a different way. And I certainly saw my father and his mother and her father and I could suddenly look back through this river of linear time and see why he was who he was. His mother was a serious piece of work. He and, you know, his father died when he was 16 and there were, he went to the war and was in the South Pacific Theater and was bombed. And, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, this young man who was my father was a very broken, traumatized person. And I could see all of that. And suddenly all of that anger and frustration about the difficult man my father was just melted away. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by saying that you can change the past. Mm. That sad, lonely little girl who wanted her daddy's love suddenly was loved, was suddenly loved as well as he could do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I really believe that everybody is doing the best they can. And it's not good enough a lot of the time, (laughs) Mm -hmm. especially when we look at our larger political picture. You think, really? They're doing the best they can? I think that most people are. And that what we, the generosity that we can bring to the world is to recognize that everybody's broken and everybody is trying to understand their story. Sally Tisdale is an author based in Portland, Oregon. What do you think about memory? What do you think about writers or non-writers' responsibility to accurately portray memory and all of its unreliability? Send us a short voicemail about a story or thought you'd like to share to thedetour at oregonhumanities.org. We might include it in our next episode. Last month, we released our episode talking about success with kids and asked listeners to send in clips of the kids in their lives. Here's young listeners, Esther and Felix, talking about what success means to them. What's your name? Esther. What do you think about when you hear the word success? Um, I don't know. I kind of think about um, somebody hugging another person and, and, and like them becoming best friends. And living together and having a happy life. What's your name? Felix. What do you think about when you hear the word success? Getting a job and fulfilling your goals, like getting a nice house. The Detour is produced by Kieran Bond. Dave Friedlander is our editor. Ben Waterhouse, Karina Brisky, and Alexandra Powell-Bugden are our assistant producers. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.